Okay, perfect. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Eli. I am founder and president of the Liberty Society. And tonight we're fortunate to help host Dr. Yaron Brook. Uh, Yaron was born in Israel. He uh, raised and uh, raised and born in Israel and began his career, his journey in uh, the IDF. He served in military intelligence and then began his academic career in the Technion Institute for Technology in Haifa. He then moved to the States to earn his MBA and PhD from the University of Texas. He has also written many articles featuring in Forbes, USA Today, and many other publications. Today, Yaron is a world-renowned objectivist philosopher. He is executive chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute. He is host of the Yaron Brook Show and he is best-selling author. Tonight he's going to talk to us about the roots of war uh, and the current Russia-Ukraine climate. We are also, uh, after the talk, we're going to have a Q&A. I will kick it off uh, to get the ball rolling and then I'm going to open up to questions from the audience. This event is also a fundraiser for the Red Cross. We will be selling prints and we're also going to be raising funds for the Ukraine Freedom Fund and I'll explain more about that later. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Yaron Brook. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very glad we're using this also as an opportunity to raise funds for, for Ukraine. It's a good cause. Um, I will say I'm not a philosopher. Um, my iPad is working. Oh, I need to look at music. Um, I am not a philosopher, although I'm, I'm trained in objectivist philosophy, but I, I, don't, I don't have the pretense of being a philosopher. I am an intellectual who's written about a lot of different topics, uh, but primarily, but all from the perspective of Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. I used to be the CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute, and now I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the chairman of the board. So one of the issues that I have written about um, over the years, and obviously that is very much at the headlines today, and when Eli contacted me to do a talk and we were considering what to do, and usually I give talks on inequality, on capitalism, and I've, you know, you can find them online, and there are dozens of versions of them, and they're all over the place. That was under consideration, but then I thought, why not do something that's that's really in the headlines, and really in the news, and that's happening right now, and we're all, I think, hopefully disturbed by, uh, and that is what's going on in Ukraine uh, between Ukraine and Russia. That is war, right? And it's 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 a little jarring, I think, for most Europeans, because. You really haven't had a war since World War II, not on this scale, not where one country is invading another, not at the level of destruction and the number of lives that have been killed uh, in, this, in this conflict. And I think many people in the world out there, many people in Europe in particular, are asking the question, why? How do we get to the point where after these unbelievably destructive wars, World War I, World War II, we now have another war in Europe? We've avoided this for... You know, uh, almost for 75 years, how did we get to the point where we, we've got another one right on our board? So I, I think the whole idea, the whole issue of war is an interesting one. I think the causes of war are really interesting. Ayn Rand, I'll just give a plug here because I encourage you to read this essay. Ayn Rand wrote an essay years ago called The Roots of War. So uh, even though this talk is, is also titled Roots of War, I, you know, I'm not pretending uh, to, I'm not just going to deliver her talk or uh, pretending to be as good as what she presented, but I encourage you to read the essay. The essay is available online for free. Just put Roots of War, Ayn Rand, and you can read it. I think it's very powerful in terms of where war comes from, and hopefully it'll be consistent with what I say here today. Generally, I'm hoping that you're interested enough in what I say that it piques your interest to, enough to read some Ayn Rand. That's my goal. Right. It's not to convince anybody, it's really to create some kind of dissonance we talked about, right? But to create some interest so that you read um, more of Ayn Rand's. And of course, if, if, uh, if you're interested in following me, uh, I do have a YouTube channel um, where I, I, uh, I, I do a show just me talking about stuff uh, pretty much, uh, I don't know, four times a week, something like that, when I'm, when I'm actually home, which is rare these days. So, whoa! All right, there they are. Um, so, war. Well, let's start with the basic fact that war is 
incredibly horrific. It is destructive. This is what they want to prevent people from saying. The evil of war. What is the evil? Uh, people die. Property is destroyed. Civilizations can be wiped out. Whole peoples can be wiped out. There's nothing more savage. There's nothing more brutal. There's nothing more destructive in human experience in the history. It's okay, I can talk about music in the background. That's, uh, that's, <laughs> we can we'll all survive this, right? Um, DNB is a taste of Bristol. What's that? DNB is a taste of Bristol. It's just not the first time, and it's not, I, I, I assume, not going to be the last time either. If they just stay out there and they try to just rough them up there, that's fine. Um, they should come in and ask questions. That, that would be the reasonable thing to do, right? Uh, but, uh, but the unlikely thing to do. So, I think we have to start with the with fact, with the reality, that if you care about human life, if human flourishing is your standard, if human well-being is your standard, if being, if being successful in life is your standard, and it certainly is mine, and it is for every healthy human being, then war is the worst possible outcome for any. If you value individual life, if individual life matters, and at the end of the day, what life is there except for individual life, right? Each one of us is a life. There's no collective life. There's no collective anything, really. There's individuals. And then again, war is truly horrific. So the question is, why do we do it? You know, why does a, uh, a you know a, a species, and and really war is unique to human beings. Other species don't do it. Why is why do we as a species engage in warfare? What is it that drives us to engage in the slaughter of other human beings and the destruction of property and civilizations? in mass. And of course, all of human history is one war after another war after another war after another war. This is not an aberration. There are few periods in human history that have seen relatively pe relative peace. We just lived through one. The last 80 years in Europe have been a period of relative peace. So I think it's important to study both what leads up to a war and what ultimately, why ultimately we have these periods of peace? What ends wars? What leads us to a situation where war is, you know, people abandon the idea of war? And we, and periods of peace are important because I think they tell us a lot about the value systems that people adopt when they abandon warfare. I think they're causal. So it's important to find the causal roots of warfare. So we look at wars. What's interesting is that we today, and, and through a, a chunk of our history, understand that violence between individuals is wrong. You know, maybe those people out there don't quite have got a quite the message civilization <laughs> about this. But generally there's a certain understanding that violence between individuals is wrong. Will Smith getting up on stage and slapping Chris Rock, I assume you saw that in the Academy Awards, is wrong. You don't use violence, you don't use force. What we haven't yet completely accepted is that even a group, that a group deciding to use force in another group is wrong. And the question is, why? And the question is, do we really understand why violence is wrong between individuals? Why is it wrong if I insult you for you to punch me in the face? As Chris Rock, again, or Smith, did. What, what is wrong about that? Indeed, there are many people on Twitter and elsewhere defending Will Smith. He was insulted. It's funny because, you know, the people who supposedly defend free speech on the right are suddenly defending Will Smith's right to punch him. So it's okay. 
It's okay to punch if your wife is insulted, but it's not okay to punch, I don't know, a Nazi. I, I don't know. Or, or it's, so if the left does it, it's wrong. But if Will Smith does it, I, I don't even know what his politics are, it's okay. So there is generally, on left and right, real confusion about why it's wrong for individuals to engage in violence against one another. Because, and why is it free speech so important? Need a big, uh, big speaker? Why don't we actually just concentrate on what you say I am. I'll just make side comments once in a while. <laughs> just for the fun of it. I'm not going to debate them. What's that? I can't hear you. It's just, part of the problem. Just as if it exists. I'm trying. Yeah. Believe me, I'm trying. But uh, if I joke once in a while about the fact that they're out there, I don't think that's a bad thing. Right? Uh, plus, it'll give the people watching the video some context of what's going on. <laughs> they're not experiencing it live. So uh, you gotta, you got to use the opportunities given to you. So. so what is it about individual violence that is wrong? Well, I think to know that, to understand that, we first have to understand what it is that human nature consists of. What is it that makes us human? What is it that allows individuals to thrive, to flourish, to be successful? Because if we're making the case that wars are anti-human, if we're making the case that wars are bad for humanity, bad for individual flourishing, well, what is it that individual flourishing actually consists of? And what does it require? And only then can we see whether violence is pro-individual flourishing or violence is anti-individual flourishing. Right? We might be able to observe the fact that it's anti, but it'd be good to understand the actual causes behind it. So what does it mean to be human? What is it that makes us human? What is it that allows us to be successful as human beings? Ignore. What is it that makes it us succeed as human beings. So, what, what, what is it that makes us human? And don't say thumbs. <laughs> what, 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 what's the difference between us and every other species out there in, in, in the world? Perhaps the ability for empathy? The ability for empathy, but is that really, you know, did, did we advance from the caves to where we are today because of empathy? Adaptability. Adaptability, yes, we're very good at adapting, but what causes us to be able to be adaptable, right? Adaptability is a feature. The question is, what is it about us that makes it possible for us to be to adapt? Well, uh, physical judgment skills, physical thinking, and this uh, all too many beings are sentient, and this is only really going to get to human beings and actually to make this critical judgment. So critical judgments? Well, human has everlasting great. Like, it doesn't matter... Everlasting? Great. Greed. Yes. Greed. Um, yes, we, you know, it depends on how you define greed. Um, we, we, we want more. We want better. We want to advance. But the question is what makes it possible for us to advance. It's not the wanting that is enough. And indeed, why do we want more? What leads us to want more? What is the source of the wanting? But, what was your name? Edward. Edward is on the right track. What makes us different? What makes us human? And it's a little bit shocking that any group, this isn't self-evident, and it says something about the education system, in my view. Right? What makes a student is our capacity to reason. It's a capacity to think. It's a capacity to figure stuff out. That's the difference. That's how we change our environment. That's how we get more. Right? That's all of that is part of the fact that we can think, we can plan. We can change our environment to fit our needs. We can manipulate the world to make it better for us. And we do that by using our mind, by using our reason. Reason is man's means of survival. It is our basic means of survival. There is no humanity without a capacity to think, without a capacity to reason. Because think of it, um, at a very basic level, does anybody here have the gene for hunting or the gene for agriculture? How do we hunt? You know, have you ever seen, I don't know, what's a wild animal that you hunt here? 
Oh, in ancient times, what have we not yet? Deer. Deer. You ever seen a deer? You all know what a deer is, right? The fast. You try running down a deer and biting into it and slowing it down or whatever. You can't do it. You can't do it. We're, if you look around the room, we're a good specimen. We're a good sample of humanity here in this room. Maybe a little too male. Maybe a little geeky. But generally a good, good sample of humanity in this room. And we're pathetic when it comes to physical abilities. We're slow. We're weak. We have no claws. We have no fangs. We have no ability to survive out there without what? Without our wits. Without the ability to grab weapons. Without the ability to have a strategy and catch the deer. Without tools. Without traps. You can't go hunting. Hunting is a cerebral activity. It's an activity of the mind. Agriculture is the same thing. We don't know how to, I mean, for hundreds of thousands, for tens of thousands of years, we didn't do agriculture. It's only in the last 10,000. Did we do it? Some genius figured it out and created a whole industry around it. So, every achievement that human beings have made, every more, every step forward, every advance, is a product of the human mind. It's a product of reason, it's a product of rational thinking. We don't emote this. You don't discover truths through emotions. Maybe truth about yourself, but not about the world. You don't figure out new technologies. You don't write program software based on emotions. All of that is a product of your mind. And of course, who thinks? Who has a mind? Well, individuals do. There's no collective consciousness floating around this room. There's no other people thinking for you. Only you can think for yourself. You might let other people do the think for you because you default to your own personal responsibility to think for yourself. But actual thinking can only be done inside your head for you. There's no collective consciousness anymore than there's a collective stomach. Nobody can eat for you. We know that, but for some reason we assign thinking to other people and we just follow their orders. So, the individual is the unit that matters. It's the thinking unit. It is the unit that matters for survival. It is what actually allows for progress. And yet, we are told over and over and over again by our leaders, political, philosophical, religious, that what matters is not the individual. What matters is the group. What matters is the collective. What matters is some aggregate of all these individual minds and all these individual lives. We started out our lives as tribal, where the individual was suppressed. I'm sure the guy who invented the bow and arrow, what do you think happened to him? Celebrated him? He got shot with his own invention, perhaps. What's that? He got shot. He probably got shot with his own invention if he was lucky. Because the other way, you know, where they usually burn you at the stake is a little bit more painful than actually just dying with his own weapon. But yeah, we don't appreciate the people who advance civilization. We don't appreciate the individuals who actually invent and produce and create. We tend to penalize them for those. We don't like new ideas. Nobody liked Galileo when he said, no, 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 it, it, it's the earth the world goes around the sun, not the sun that goes around the earth. You're negating an ancient book, therefore we're going to put you in house arrest. And he was lucky. 200 years or 100 years earlier, you would be burned to the So, we have been taught from very early on, we have been taught to view the collective, the group, the tribe as primary, and not the individual. It's one of the reasons that I think we're not taught the value of the human mind, the value of reason, what actually makes us human, and the contributions human beings have made through thinking to human problems. I can go on and speak to them. 
Um, you guys okay? Yeah. All right. So we've always been taught that there is a collective. And that the collective is what matters, the individual doesn't matter. That the individual life, the individual prospects, the individual success is not what matters. What really matters is the group, the tribe, the nation, the collective, the race, the proletarian, some group. And of course, how do we know what this group needs? How do we know what this group wants? Because we're all expected to sacrifice to the group. Every single ethical theory that we've ever had as human beings is about how individuals should sacrifice their well-being for the sake of the group. That individual well-being doesn't matter. Whether it's our religions that tell us to sacrifice for an afterlife or for the state or for the group or for humanity, our lives as individuals don't matter to them. What matters, again, is this collective. How do we know what the collective wants? Like, again, there's no collective mind here, so I don't know what you want. I can ask you all, but then there might be conflicts and might disagreements, and many of you might say, I don't know. I don't know. So what almost always emerges from these collectivist societies, it doesn't emerge, it's what's imposed on these collectivistic societies. What always emerges? What always emerges is a voice that says, I know what the collective needs. And typically there are two voices. One is a political leader who says, I'm strong, I represent you, do what I tell you, everything is going to be okay. And then the people says, who the hell are you? Why should we believe what you say? So then a second leader emerges and says, because I, the witch doctor we'll call him, speak to the spirits and anoint this guy as our leader. And what makes him a leader is this ability to commune with some other world in which truth is found. Because you, as an individual, are meaningless. You don't count. I mean, how do we know what's good for the proletariat? We'll take one example of collectivism. Marxism. How do we know what's good for the proletariat? Did the proletarian announce what's good for them? No. I mean, who is the proletarian? Where are they? And what do we, we poll them? We take a survey? We are allowed to vote, God forbid. No. We have a leader emerge, whether it's Lenin or Stalin or somebody else, or Mao Zedong, who says, No, I speak for the politics. And how do we know you speak for the church? Because I can commute. That, you know, in, in these guys, the witch doctor and the political leader emerge into one. I speak. Because I can commune with what's truly good for the politician. I know what they really want. And many of them don't know this. And, you know, because what we're trying to do is, is, is to benefit the politician, some people have to die to benefit the politician. It doesn't matter. Because individuals don't matter. What matters is the politician. Or well, how do we know what the Aryan race wants? Well, we need a leader. Out comes somebody like Hitler and says, I know what's good for the for the, for the Aryan race. I channel the spirits of all Aryans. And here it is. And right now, right now, as we sit here, there is a leader who is channeling the spirit of the Russian people, the spirit of the history of Russia, the spirit of the Russian soul. And he just listen to his talks, listen to his speeches. They're not about NATO, they're not about anything. They're actually about what's good for the Russian people, the destiny of the Russian people, the history of the Russian people. Ukraine, our soul brothers, they must be part of the Russian people, the Russian empire, the Russian future. And he speaks for the Russians. And he's challenging truth from another dimension where Russian consciousness must reside to tell us what's good for the Russians. And you see, once you negate the individual, once what matters is the group, once what matters is the collective, then pursuing whatever the group, whatever the leader of the group wants, that's the mission. It's not about human flourishing. It's not about individual success. And people in the other group are always what? They're always demonized. They're always the bad guys. They're always trying to take your stuff. 
They're always trying to make you worse off as a group, not as an individual. You might like some individuals on the other side, but as a group, they're always demonized. Every dictator in human history has used others to demonize and to justify war. So war is the product of a of collectivism. It is a product of caring about groups, not individuals. It is the product of not valuing individual human mind, not valuing individual reason, not valuing the pursuit of individual happiness, but the value of some mystical notion, and it's always mystical, because there's nothing in reality, of the existence of a group, and then using mystical mysticism to define a group's goals, and to define a group's motivations, and to define a group's ambitions. And one of the consequences of collectivism is to miss a really, really important feature of, of, of human beings. And that is that when human beings are free, and when human beings actually go out there and use their minds as individuals and solve problems and, and, and create and build, what we discover is that the world is not a zero-sum world. They still have yet to discover this. <laughs> they will. <laughs> that the world is not a zero sum world. That the world is a value added world. That my benefiting myself is not at other people's expense. Now, this is a lesson we've only recently learned, recently, I mean, over the last 200, 250 years. It's not a lesson we know from distant history. But what we've learned is that. Ideas actually benefit everybody, they don't just benefit the few. So, I always like to use my iPhone. I paid a thousand bucks for this. This little thing is, it cost me a thousand dollars. Why did I pay a thousand dollars for this? Why? Yeah. Yeah, because I get more than a thousand dollars of value out of this. And, and, you know, it's hard for me to explain to you how much more, because it's a lot more. Because how do you put a value on the fact that I can tell a bedtime story to my kids from anywhere in the world by video? At a cost of zero. Last time I looked, Zoom was not billing me. I've got like a monthly pan or whatever. I can access every piece of music ever written and ever produced, ever recorded. On this thing at the marginal cost if you subscribe to one of these plans marginal cost of what zero i can find this university and this building by gps with instructions tells me exactly how to get here no problem i i still remember you guys don't remember your parents will remember driving with maps not fun really hard particularly if you don't have a good sense of direction like my wife she always get lost. I, in the, the days before the iPhone, I used to get regularly at least one call a day from her. I'm lost. How do I get home? You know, things like that, right? Um, never happened anymore. No, it just doesn't happen. Not because she's changed, but because now she has a tool, which is the beauty of these things. So did I, and, and you could go on and I could, I could do a two-hour talk just on the value of the iPhone. Right? To me, and I assume it's valuable to you because most of you have the iPhones, iPhone clones of one type or another, and you've spent some real money to do it. And the reason is it's more valuable to you than the, whatever money you spent on it. And that's true of everything we buy. Why do we buy, I don't know, clothes for X amount of dollars? Because they're valuable, more valuable to us than the amount of money we spend. The, the cash in our pocket's not valuable as much as the stuff we get for it. And if we see something, we say, Hmm, that's not really worth a hundred bucks. So we don't buy it. So trade, trade, the fundamental way in which individuals interact with one another, particularly strangers, is win-win. It's not lose-win. It's not exploitative. It's value-added. I'm better off. What about Apple? Were they better off? Yeah, they made a profit. So I won. Apple one. 
And indeed, every transaction that you go, when you go to the mall, when you buy stuff at the mall, you're better off. And the people who sold you the goods are better off. So trade is a mutually beneficial activity that is individual in its nature. Because you are trading as an individual with an individual on the other side. Apple is just a collection of individuals. Just like all the consumers are collections of individuals. Trade leads us to regard other people not as enemies. Trade leads us to regard other people as what? As producers of value that you care about. So I love people. Why? Because they make my life better. You know, I don't care about people qua people. I care about people qua producers. I care about people qua artists. I care about people who create or produce or make stuff or do things that make my life and the people I care about life better. And that happens through the activity of trade. It'll intimidate them a little bit, plus it'll give us some good footage um, so people understand why all this booming is going on. Um, all right. So no, but when we think of people only as groups, when we think of people only as collectors, we tend to think about the world as a single sum game. And indeed, political leaders, oh, that helped. <laughs> political leaders <laughs> that actually encourage violence and actually encourage war always think of the world as a zero sum. What does zero sum mean? It means my gains are at your expense, your gains are at my expense. I'm going to demonize you how? I'll take an example from uh, from politics of the last few years. You know, Donald Trump was one of the most moronic presidents in human history. Really. Uh, and part of them, the, 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 this, this attitude came across in the movie Trump He demonized China, not because China was maybe an enemy of the United States, not because China violated individual rights, not because China had maybe concentration camps or anything, he didn't care. He demonized China because they had a trade deficit with him. And trade for him is a zero sum game. So if they got our cash, and we got their stuff, that was somehow negative. Even though I view it as a huge positive, I'd much rather have that stuff than cash, particularly at the time of inflation. You want stuff. Demonized immigrants, because it's a zero sum game. An immigrant comes in, he's at your expense, he's taking something from you. Instead of viewing trade as win-win, they take collectives, they take groups, and they demonize the other group because they are they are somehow you know, taking from you. They're somehow diminishing your ability to thrive and to live and to be good but as a group. So collectivism is almost always leads to zero something. Whereas as individuals, when we trade, I mean, you have to have the right mentality, but usually we view it as a win win situation. We don't think about it. But ideologies focused on individualism are always ideologies that emphasize the win win nature of the world. And you see, if I value you because you are producing something that I value that's making my life better, I don't want to do you wrong. On the contrary, I want you to thrive. I want you to succeed, because you'll succeed, it's not going to be my expense, you'll succeed is actually making my life better. It's actually a sign that you are trading with a lot of people, and therefore you're making the world a better place in some small way. So, trade is in a sense the antithesis of war. Trade is win-win. What is war? Lose, lose. Nobody wins in a war. I mean, think about Russia invading Ukraine. Does Russia win? Let's say it wins militarily. Has it won? Its own people have been killed. Its economy is in shambles. And counter to a lot of so-called economists out there, 
I emphasize so-called, wars do not produce economic activity. They destroy economic activity. The U.S. did not do well after World War II because of World War II. It did well after World War II in spite of World War II. Because think about it. Before the war, you have ex-productive activity, producing goods to make human life better. And then you spend five years destroying all of that, killing hundreds of thousands of people and your own people dying. Now, sometimes you have to go to war to defend yourself, but it's still destructive. So, hundreds of thousands of people die. You, instead of building things that make human life better, you're building tanks. You're using all your productive capacity to build things that destroy, rather than build things that are actually enhancing human life. And as a consequence, you lose. So yes, the economy in the U.S. did well after World War II, but it would have been a thousand times better if there was no World War II. And if we could have traded with the Germans and traded with everybody, and all risen up together through that period, we'd all be much richer today without World War I and World War II. So trade is a feature of peace. And indeed, if you look at the eras in human history in which we've had peace, it's the era after the Napoleonic Wars. If you look at the end of the Napoleonic Wars until World War I, that is an era of globalization that you Brits were responsible for. Right? Your sole purpose in foreign policy during that period was free trade. Maybe not the sole purpose, but the major purpose in foreign policy was free trade. And as a consequence, there was no wars during that period. There were no major wars during that period. People were benevolent towards one another for the most part. And people engaged in trade that, that was mutually beneficial. And I know this is not how the 19th century is to be portrayed. For trade. And if you look at the 20th century, post-World War II, what is the feature there? It's the United States promoting what? Promoting free trade. And when people trade, they don't tend to go to war. Now, Russia is unique in this. And this is why I actually think it's unlikely that China will invade Taiwan anytime soon. I've said this publicly, so we'll see if I turn out to be true. Because China is a most is, is completely integrated into the global economy. China is a trader with everybody. China acquires foreign currency, it's how it invests, it's got trillions of dollars of US bonds. Um, it, it, it's got hundreds of millions of people working to sell things to the United States. It's not interested in war right now. Maybe one day. It's trying to become self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency is a path to war, I think. The idea of self-sufficiency is a path to war. The better integrated you are in the trading system, the less likely you are to go and fight and kill your trading partners. Because it's win-win. <laughs> the Chinese understand that better than Trump ever did. Russia is not well integrated into the global system. It is a supplier of raw materials. It does not produce new innovations. It does not produce goods and services. It is primarily just about extracting stuff from the ground and selling it. And indeed, it has created a dependency in Europe on those natural resources through funding uh, the movement against uh, fossil fuels in Germany, against nuclear in Germany. They made Germany dependent on natural gas from Russia. Why, why, why you guys in the UK, why do you have such high energy costs? Why are you worried about energy, you know, a year from now? Well, because you refuse to frack. There's plenty of natural gas in the UK. And you won't frack it. You won't extract it from the ground. So you become dependent on others to do it. But, and it, was, it, it turns out that Putin has been funding these campaigns of contracting against developing domestic production of energy in order to make the West dependent on him. Right? Because he views it as a zero-sum world. All right. They are creative. What's that? They are creative. Yeah, I mean, making noise is not creative. I mean, making uh, noise is the, is the... Making noise, like using a fist, is a tool of barbarity. There you go. Uh, yeah, I mean, what 
What are they selling? Yeah. No, wait. They make the South appropriate for their uh, cognitive attitude. Right? They wanted a debate, they would come here and debate, but that's not what they want. They want you not to think for yourself. They want you not to speak if they disagree with you. They want silence and complete acceptance of their position. That's, and that's a free, that's a free enlightenment way of thinking. Right, so peace is a product of trade. Peace is a product of viewing the individual as valuable. War is the product of zero sum thinking, and war is the product of collectivism. And part of the reason that in the 19th century we had the attitude towards trade and the attitude towards individualism is, and I'll, and I'll, just, I'll, I'll do this uh, in starting up points and then we'll, I'll take questions from you guys. What had happened in the 18th century intellectually? Well, what's, what's the name of that era in the 18th century that preceded the Industrial Revolution, that preceded this, this, uh, you guys have, you guys ever seen the graph of, okay, so this is, this is a famous graph, right? this is time, x-axis is time, right, um, y-axis is either wealth or income, doesn't matter, and we're starting, I don't know, 100,000 years ago, doesn't really matter, and basically, this is, this is, this is something like that. Some point, everything gets better. Everything gets better. Now, you might have had some, I don't know, some small rise of CM decline, maybe they have Greece and Rome. But generally, that is what's happened. How, how much richer are we today than 300 years ago? Are we richer than 300 years ago? Yeah. Look around Bristol and you can find remnants of 300 years ago and see how unpleasant they were. Well, in terms of income, well, we're about 300 times richer. In terms of actually quality of life, we're thousands of times richer. Like, did they have running water? Did they have toilets? Toilets are huge. Did they have electricity? They certainly didn't have iPhones. How do you measure any of that? You don't, me you don't pay for the water. You don't pay for the sewage. And yet, that's a huge addition to your quality of life that's not captured in the numbers. So we're thousands of times richer than we were 300 years ago. What happened in the 18th century to generate this? The Industrial Revolution, but the Industrial Revolution happens towards the end of the 18th century. What happens in the, in the 18th century to make the Industrial Revolution possible? This doesn't have an accident. This is like a once in all of human history event. And again, what's that? The invention of fertilizer. The invention of fertilizer happens here, sir. Fertilizer is an invention of relatively late. What's that? The Enlightenment period. So the period right before this is called the Enlightenment. What's another need for the Enlightenment? The age of reason. And another word for the same thing that happens parallel to this in a sense is called the age of science. What happens in the 18th century is we discover what you said. What the 18th century does is it rediscovers from ancient Greece the idea that what makes us humans is our mind. That we don't have to accept authority. That we don't have to listen to the leaders, religious or secular. That we as individuals are thinkers and can think for ourselves. Newton teaches us that. He teaches us the law of physics. And we can all kind of grasp it. And if you can't grasp Newton's laws, it's because you're a bad teacher. It's not that hard. One to explain. And people in the 18th century go, wait a minute, I can understand the physical world, because for years, decades, centuries, they were told they couldn't. They were told the physical world was described in an ancient book. But they as individuals couldn't. And then suddenly individuals go, wait a minute, if I can understand the laws of physics, if I have reason, 
If reason is universal, as Locke says, and as others say, then why can't I decide in my own profession? Why can't I decide, because what was your profession? How was your profession determined in those days? What's that? Yeah, most of the farmers, if you live in this city or that part of the field, and whatever your father did, you did. That was it. And wait a minute, what about my own white man? You didn't decide that. And by the way, the profession of women was not. Doesn't exist because you weren't individuals. You didn't count. And if you look across all the human decisions, instead of somebody else making it for me, I want to make my own decision. Like who's my political leader? I want to make that decision. Now somebody else make that decision for me. And that's why you get, you know, relative freedom. It's why at this point you get democracies or republics or where people can actually vote for their own leadership. It's why suddenly the idea of arranged marriages disappears. It's why suddenly the guilds fall apart and suddenly people are choosing their own professions and doing what they all want, what they want. It's why if you invent a steam engine, you can go off and build a steam engine and build a whole industry around it, and you don't have to get permission from the king or permission from anybody else, it becomes, during this period, a permissionless society. Individuals are left free to use their reason to pursue their life the way they want to pursue their life, not the way an authority dictates to them. And that leads to this massive flourishing, this massive success, this massive creation of wealth. It's the respect for the individual that makes and reason that makes all the progress we've experienced over the last 200 years plus possible. It's the exact opposite of the collectivists. And indeed, one of the saddest phenomena today, and one that I think is going to lead us to more war, not less, is that we're abandoning individualism. We're abandoning, abandoning the idea of the individual's right to pursue his own life using his own reason to achieve his own happiness. And we're back to the collectivist story where there's Russian collectivism, Chinese collectivism, or in America, the different tribes, the political tribes, where people don't think for themselves but are dictated from the tribal leaders what to do and what to say and what to think. Or, you know, it's even Brexit. Depends on the motivations. What were the motivations of the British people to vote for Brexit? Was it to establish a freer England, freer UK, than they could under the European Union? Or was it to keep those non-Brits out? And the evidence suggests that it's a second today. Because, you, you know, when people voted for Brexit, at least the people I know who really supported Brexit, all said, oh no, as soon as we get Brexit, we're going to establish ourselves as a free trade island. We're going to eliminate all those regulations the EU forced on us. We're going to become a beacon of freedom to the world. And you've done the exact opposite. You've kept all the regulations. You've uh, eliminated all the benefits of the EU in terms of trade. You've eliminated the benefits of the EU in terms of migration. You've eliminated the benefits of the EU in terms of capital flows. You've not taken advantage of this opportunity to make yourself more free. You've taken this opportunity to make yourself more uh, English, British, UK-ish, I don't know what the term is. But collectivism is on the rise all over the world. It's represented by right-wing parties. It's represented by left-wing parties. But it is the group superiority to the individual. And that always, always, always in history leads to war. In a few places, the few errors that valued individuals are the errors that value freedom and ultimately are the errors that were peaceful. Thank you.
Uh, I've also <laughs> invited them inside if they're willing to talk and not make animal noises, uh, but they refuse. So uh, we'll, we'll continue and we'll try and uh, finish this event on a positive light. So I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, it, it's actually a crit so one of the criticisms I've heard of objectivism. So my understanding of objectivism is that it's founded on self-interest, on egoism, yep. uh, on selfishness. How how do you facilitate that in a real world of war, where sometimes there is a necessity for soldiers, for policemen, or self-sacrificial jobs to, to be held? Like, do objectivists rely on non-objectivists to fill those positions? That's pretty funny. Uh, we used to have a joke in our objectivist, uh, little objectivist community in, in Israel that we needed at least one altruist every gathering afterwards to wash the dishes and to clean up after us because uh, we were all too self-interested to actually do the work. Uh, but that's a joke, right? It's not reality. No, of course not. What you rely on is the self-interest of individuals to fight for something that's just, that's something that's right, that's something that's good for them. If you threaten my family, I'm going to fight for them, even if I have to lose my life. I am going to do everything I can to protect them. Why? Because of my altruism? No, because I'm an egoist. Because I love myself, my life, and therefore my family more than anything else. I will fight for it. And if you're going to threaten my freedom, if you're going to threaten my freedom, I'm going to fight for it. Why? Because I don't want to live in an unfree place. I don't want to live under the boots of an authoritarian. So I will fight the authoritarian. If you're going to send terrorists to my country and blow up my buildings, I am going to fight against you because I don't want to be in one of those buildings. I don't want my children to be in one of those buildings. So, the military proper, and this is why you should never have a draft. All military should be voluntary. I think all funding of wars should be voluntary. That's pretty controversial. Right? Everything should be voluntary around wars because you should do it because you value it. Now, the question is, will they do it? Like, I, I tell the Israelis, like in Israel, I say, um, there should be no conscription in Israel. It should be a completely voluntary job. And people say, but well, what if they don't volunteer? What if nobody volunteers? I said, then Israel doesn't deserve to exist. It just doesn't. If you're not willing to fight for something, you don't care about it, then why should it exist? So, I'm counting on people being self-interested. I want them to, and if you ask soldiers on the battlefield, in a just war, not in any war, in a just war, that is in a war of self-defense, why are you here? To defend my family, to defend my home, to defend my freedom, but it's all mine. It's not to defend some abstraction, it's to defend something real to them, and that's good, right? If you ask the Russians right now in Ukraine, what are they fighting for? Well, you'll get one of two answers. I don't know. Because many of them don't, sadly. And the other answer is from Mother Russia. That's sad. And that's destructive. Um, if you ask Ukrainians right now what they're fighting for, you see this in Zelensky, you see this when you meet a few people on the street, what are they fighting for? Their neighborhood, their home, their family, their community, their lives. They're being super self -interested. Invaders. Initiators of force are not self interested. Never. They're about some mystical cause. They're about some great vision which is destructive to everybody involved. It's only the defendants, and it's only the defense of individual rights who is up. The same with police. Look, police is, a, it, it, police is a profession that you go into knowing that what are you doing? You're defending civilization, you're defending the idea that force between human beings is wrong. This is, by the way, why I'm against laws that don't, that, that criminalize activities that do not involve force. So criminalize activities where this, where, where, you know, uh, uh, I'll give you an example. I'm against laws that prohibit drug use. Right? Why? Because if you want to ruin your life, you should have every ability to ruin your life. But a policeman now has to stop you from doing that. 
But that shouldn't be his job. And it, it feels weird for him to be doing that. Plus, because you've criminalized that there's a lot of money involved, and you'll find that most police corruption involves drug laws. Because it's not what they should be doing. They should be catching murderers and thieves and crooks of all kinds. And, you know, they're, they're instead distracted to, you know, victim the spy, where the victim is yourself. Well, if you want to commit suicide, come on, my goodness. I'm not going to sacrifice a policeman to try to stop you. So, uh, I, think, I think these are self-interested activities. People want to live in a society where, people, where there's no murder in the street, where people are not fucking each other, where people are not stealing each other. And some people like police work and they would volunteer to do police work. I mean, they could pay, but they volunteer to do it. You don't force people to do police. And that's why it's really important that your laws are objective, they're good, and they actually involve justice that's not just random and arbitrary. Fantastic. So we're going to open up to questions from the audience now. Here's a way to stand for you. We're all heading out to the safe place. Don't worry. There's security outside, please throw it away. So thank you very much. That's the corner. You're going to have to have to release the numbers. Yeah, we are. So we have some different Come forward, question for the mic. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, come forward, and then, and then, because otherwise I can't hear. Okay. Um, for what age does someone exercise self-interest, yeah. full self-interest? But surely, if a parent holds their child to take drugs, surely they couldn't make a, an informed decision. Yeah. So, at what age uh, does self-interest in a sense kick in, and what responsibilities do parents have in terms of their child's self-interest? I mean, that's a tricky question. Um, because on the one hand, you want to give uh, the parents the freedom to be able to handle their kids and deal with their kids as they see fit. It's not the state's role to intervene. But if the, if the parents are abusing their kids, because the kids are not being able to stand up for their own self-interest, then that's where the state, I think, needs to intervene and needs to stop it. So certainly if the parents are giving the kids drugs, or if the parents are physically abusing the kids, or doing things like that, that's where the state should intervene to protect the rights of the children. What age do you get the ability to make your own decisions for yourself? And it, it really is a question of reason, right? When do you have the full capacities of rationality? And, you know, some argue that you don't get it until your early 20s, right? I'm not going to insult the people in this room to <coughs> arguing that because I think some of you are below that age. But not everybody gets it at the same time. I think it's uh, rational and reasonable for the government to set an age, whether it's 18 or 16 or whatever, beyond which you're treated as an individual adult and before that you're treated as a child. Um, but, for example, if you're 16 and you believe you're mature enough to live by yourself and not be subjugated to whatever your parents want you to do, you go in front of a judge and you prove, I think you can do that today, you prove yourself that you want to be emancipated, I think they call it, and you can be. So, but these are tricky legal issues that have to be sorted out in a free society. And we do a decent job at that, I think, today. Maybe we could do better, but it's not bad the way it's done today. All right, go to this side. Yeah. Yeah, I'll stay next to you. I'm sure. Um, firstly, Joshua, 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 sorry. Firstly, thank you so much for your talk. I know he's gone, but thank you to Eli as well for always coming. Oh, absolutely. For this society. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of questions. First, about what you said, um, and secondly, about what's going on outside. Yep. Um, about what you said, um, do you not think that your analysis of how collectivization leads to basically despotism is like significantly flawed, given you mischaracterized collectivist societies with almost fascist societies? with autocratic leaders that have zero accountability, and there are plenty of examples of collective societies with significant accountability um, that do not lead to despotism. Um, and secondly, Can you give an example? Or what's a collective society? They don't lead to despotism, yeah. Uh, Kibbutzim in Israel, for example. Good, okay. Uh, as, as, you know, along with many yep. others. Again, yeah, I, you know, I appreciate you probably you're going to respond with examples such as now, etc. No, I'm going to respond to the Kibbutzim, that's fine. That's no, why I want an example, because I can... I can you know, these are, you know, yeah. now it's your interpretations, but nonetheless, there are plenty of other examples. Sure. And secondly, in terms of what's going on outside, in ter of course, speech occurs in a context, um, and 
what someone says down the pub is very different from someone who says at a lectern um, at a university. Um, from your others that I've heard prior to today, I haven't I have engaged so much in your work before, but I'm sure I went afterwards. From your understanding, I've been to plenty of talks and it's never happened before. What do you think is that's prompted them? To what is it about me that they really upset? So, yeah, I'll, I'll, say, I'll tell you. Um, so, uh, let me address the first thing. It is true that not every collectivistic society necessarily leads to authoritarianism and to despotism. But it's also true that only collectivistic societies lead to authoritarian death. That is, non-collectivist societies never lead to that. And in the process, when a society is a, is a non-despotic society and becomes a despotic society, the middle frame is always collectivization. It's always a movement towards collectivism that ultimately results in that. But I will say this, collectivism always leads to failure. And then societies have to choose once it's failed, how they're going to resolve that failure. And if you would see a great example of it. They can either resolve that failure through violence, or they can resolve that failure through giving up on the collectivism. The kibbutzim are a great example, I don't know if you know what kibbutzim are in Israel. They're really communal living taken to the nth degree. I mean, the original kibbutzim, the ones that were most consistent, you didn't even raise your own children. Children were raised communally. Uh, homes didn't have kitchens. The kitchen was communal. Every home looked exactly the same. The television was the same size. Uh, you know, everything was the same uh, from a material perspective. Uh, so the, uh, the, 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 the whole idea of kibbutzim was the, was the collectivization, but it was voluntary. You could leave. You could enter, but if you entered, you had to give up all your material possessions to the kibbutz. Right? You couldn't keep a bank account in the city. You had no material possessions. You had to give them all up to the kibbutz. And the fact is that the kibbutzim all failed. All of them. They only survived as long as they did because they were subsidized by the government. Or by rich Jews overseas before there was an Israeli government. And ultimately, modern times, when the government stopped subsidizing it, they all failed economically. What did they do? They didn't revert to violence, that's true. But what they did revert is to abandoning the notion of this collectivization. What they, what they embraced is they became villages. And they've taken up private property and they split the, 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 the you know, so they've taken out the elements of collectivism capitalism and, and dismissed uh, individualism, dismissed the ideas of collectivism. You've got countries that are collectivists, right? Um, I don't know, right now Hungary is a good example of a collectivist country. It's probably not going to go to war. But the only reason it's not going to go to war, I believe, to the, if they push this further in terms of the collectivization, is because they're too weak and there's nobody need to go to war with. It's that they could beat, right? Russia could do it because they believe that they were powerful. So there are other pragmatic considerations in terms of why something goes to war or not. China is a very collectivist society, but it's intermersed in this trade, so we don't fear war too much. But that could change like that because of the collectivization. Uh, Vietnam now that it's just as collective, it's probably not going to go to war because who's he going to fight? And, and it, again, it doesn't have enough power to actually eject. So, Every warlike society has been a collective society. And if you want ancient history, one good example is between Sparta and, and Athens. And Sparta and Athens were very different. Sparta was a warlike society. The individual didn't matter. It was Sparta that mattered for everything. You, you know, don't, don't get your view of uh, Sparta from the movie 300. It's not an accurate historical representation in any respect, including an idea spot. Sparta, everything was for Sparta. Athens was much more individualistic, much less warlike. What was Athens? How did Athens get rich? Through trade. Athens spread out and traded with the world. Sparta was primarily focused on conquest. So you see this over and over again in history. It's not that every time you see collectivism, it will lead to war. It's only collectivists go to war, and with the rise of collectivism, I fear more wars. Now, what is it that they hate about me? Yeah. Just say, since you start speaking, then post it on social media, using you being Islamophobe. Yes, I'm Islamophobe 
I'm a racist. I'm anti-Palestinian. Um, I, uh, I, I, you know, you can find quotes taken out of context where I approach you. You can find quotes taken out of context where I approve of uh, photo war. Which means uh, I, I don't. I support. I, I, I think I uh, wish you were exactly what some of the most immoral acts I've ever committed. Uh, in terms of war for so I'm totally assuring myself. Um, no, no, sorry, I'm going to tell you what I really think. Like, not, not, I haven't, you know, it's pure. Uh, and all my essays are online, you can read all the stuff, you can, you can actually find it. Um, I do believe you're assuming it's not a sector, it's not the most moral act ever done. Because they basically ended a brutal, unbelievably horrific war, where millions of people were being slaughtered, the Japanese have committed unbelievably evil atrocities. And in one act, over two two days, I think, two or three days, the war was ended, and no more people died. Now, hundreds of people died to achieve that, but they were going to die anyway. If the invasion of Japan by American forces would have resulted in millions of people dying. American troops dying and Japanese dying. But, in my theory, again, and I don't have time to explain the whole thing, if you're defending yourself, Japan started the war. Japan is responsible for all the war's casualties, every single last one. Not America, but it's defending itself, it's trying to end it. Um, the US firebombed pretty much every city in Japan before he was here, killing hundreds of thousands of people. Ultimately, that ended the war. And all the blood, all of it is on the Japanese. What's interesting about it is that you don't have Japanese terrorists blowing up American buildings. You don't have hatred of Japanese towards America. On the contrary, Japanese are, are, are friends of America. And, and when you visit America or when you visit Japan, the Japanese are very friendly towards Americans. Why? Because what the damage that was done did is it shook them away from us. It made them realize how barbaric their civilization had been and caused them to change course. Indeed, they still live under a constitution in Japan, written for them by General MacArthur, which is based on the American constitution, which is better than the general. So, I believe in war, you win. If, if, you're, if you're on the right side, right, and if you're acting in self-defense, you act in war in order to win. And you do whatever is necessary to win. And if you don't, you lose, and they lose. So, uh, the worst thing you could do is go to a war and not win. If, if, again, if, if you're the right people on the right. What the other issue? Am I an Islamophobe? I don't like Islam. But you know what? I don't like Judaism, and I don't like Christianity. And I'm known as a massive critic of Christianity in particular. I particularly don't like Christianity. You can ask me why if you want. But I don't like Judaism, I don't like good religion, I don't believe in religion, any of them. But the fact is that in this, in the last 20 years, the only religion that has gone out of its way to kill people are people who claim to represent Islam. Now, there are other Muslims who don't want to attack me. I love them, I have no problem with them, right, as individuals. But, I am opposed to people trying to kill me based on religion. And if there was, if Christians were trying to kill me based on religion, I'd be a Christian foe. I don't know. Call me what you want. So I don't. I don't. I believe there are reasons why it's Islam. I think the reason, kind of reason why it's Islam, is because they were secularized. Christianity was secularized by the Enlightenment. Judaism was secularized by the Enlightenment. Islam never had an Enlightenment. They had a Renaissance that died. Indeed, I've written extensively about the beauty of the Islamic Renaissance in, uh, between uh, about 815 and 12, and even going into the 1300s in Spain. It's one of the greatest periods in human history. The science and philosophy and all the medicine all flourished under Islam because they were respectful of Greek ideas. And again, I've written about this, you can find it online. But, I, you know, I'm not an Islamophobe, I don't know what that means, I don't treat Muslims any different than I treat any other human being, unless I think that you're trying to kill me, and then I try to kill them. Your personal of practical Islamic interpretation that leads to Islamic terrorism. Yes. No, I'm opposed to Islam per se, as much as I'm opposed to Christianity per se. So 
So I, I'm opposed to religion. I think religion is a forceful heel in the world. All religions. Okay? You know, and, and you can grade the religions. You can say some are worse than others, right? Have, on different issues. I think Islam is better than Christianity, for example, on commerce. Uh, Christianity is better in other respects. So you can, I mean, why can't we talk about this? But that is Islam. I don't know if I'm you know, when you say that jihadism, the idea of using, of killing people in order to, that is, uh, uh, promote your cause, is an evil idea. It just is. And if you hold that view of the world, you're evil. Um, and I, if you're going to try to kill me, I'm going to kill you first. So that's my position. Um, is there any Palestinian question? I have nothing against Palestinians, um, but they have been betrayed by their leaders over and over and over again. And I think the Israelis are on the right with regard to the conflict. And I think the Palestinians are in the wrong because they've been betrayed by their leaders. I mean, again, on every one of these issues, we go on and on and on. I treat people as individuals. I don't care what race you are, what kind of skin you have. I care about your ideas. Some ideas are poor. But most of those ideas are, you know, white people's ideas, not, not anybody else's, right? So it's, it's, it's got nothing to do with race, religion, or anything. It's got to do with the ideas that you hold. You hold that whole idea and they call you on it. If you're socialists, are calling you on it. If you're communists, are calling you on it. If you're fascists, are calling you on it. And if you want to kill me in the name of religion, I'm going to call you on it. Or in the name of your people, Palestinian, I'm going to call you on it. But otherwise, I'm not a racist. Never have been, don't have a reason for me, my body. So, unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. Uh, ideally, we would run this event for another half hour, but we'd have to evacuate fairly soon. So, uh, I saw you with your hand up uh, for quite a while. So, I'll ask you a question and we'll, we'll reiterate. So you, you can yeah, ask no, I can't hear otherwise, so he's okay. coming for. Yeah, so, um, well, thanks a lot for the event. That's the first thing. Um, well, I'd like to um, ask a question about war and liberty. Now, war and liberty, liberty, um, or democracy, or freedom. Yep. Now, it well, it looks like that um, if you do not prepare for the war, um, you know, the cost of the war is excessive, and um, to um, you know, keep the liberty of the certain society. Like, for example, um, China in 1949, when. Um, Chinese Communist Party took over China, and then since then, uh, it, billions of people have been suffering um, yep. under this totalitarian regime. So, yep. um, I'm wondering whether you actually, um, you know, whether, how you think um, we, we, where's the, uh, where's the, um, where's so, the so, for the so you could think of, Yaron, could you please sum up the gist of the question for the benefit of Yeah, so, so the gist of the question is, what about liberty? What about the fact, for example, in 1949, nobody intervened. They allowed Mao Zedong to take over all of China. As a context of that, anywhere between 20 to 100 million people probably died. It was a brutal regime. There was no freedom. There was no liberty. And, and millions of people died. Should, I'm interpreting now, and you tell me if this is correct, should the world, the United States, because it was only super at the time, intervene and, and eliminated Mao Zedong to allow China to be free? Is that a good capturing of the question? Well, um, no, what I was saying would be um, how, um, how, how America should have been more, um, you know, giving more weapons or giving more to more. Chiang Kai Shek. Yeah, Chiang Kai Shek. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, do you want to. Do you want to uh, yeah. So I'll just say it's a tricky question. So I don't believe, because I'm, a, I'm an egoist, right? So if you if you look at countries, what should countries do? Uh, I think the role of government is to protect its citizens. Its citizens. But that means to protect their rights. To protect them from fraud and force and corruption inside, and to protect them from invaders from the outside. But when there's no external threat to the country, I don't think the country should you know, go out of its way to fight for other people, even if it's for good cause, even if it's for their living. Now, that's not the same as helping them. I think we should have helped them. Uh, I don't know how much, I don't know enough about the war, whether it would have made a difference and how much you would have helped and how much military. I mean, look, we, we tried, Europe tried, and the US, I think, tried a little bit to fight the communists in Russia. 
So uh, the White Army was funded by the West, and uh, I think some even Western troops landed in Russia to fight, fight against the communists, and we lost. So it, 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 and, and the Russians, it, the communists ultimately won that battle. So it's not clear that helping Chuck Eshek would have helped. Chuck Eshek was also not the best guy in the world, right? It's not like he was pro liberty. He was, a, he was a bit of a fascist, right? And in Taiwan, they didn't have liberty until he died. It's only after he died that they have liberty. So it's very tricky to go and support somebody in the name of liberty when that person maybe is not for liberty. So I believe America should stay out of these wars unless there's a clear good guy and bad guy. Uh, Ukraine, I think, right now is a good example. I don't think American troops should fight in Ukraine. Even if Russia had no nuclear weapons, even if there's no risk of a World War III, a nuclear World War III, I don't think American kids should die for Ukrainians. Even though Ukrainians are just, even though the cause is good. Now, should we give them weapons? Should we give them all the support? Absolutely. Should we buy posters to support the Red Cross to help the Ukrainians? Absolutely. It's 10 pounds. You should all do it. Uh, it's matched, I think. There's a $10 match for everything. Yes, yeah, so every dollar you put, I'm going to buy some. So you guys should do it um, because it's a good cause. And Americans should support it. Private Americans, and maybe the government should. You know, it's complicated for the government to do it. Get the government to do weapons, everything like that. But to actually put American kids on, in the battlefield of the Ukraine, who wins? Right? I mean, the kids are going to die. For what? Not for their liberty. I, it goes back to my answer earlier. Not for their home, not for their family, not for their liberty. For the Ukrainians. And as nice as Ukrainians are, that's not the job of the American government. You want to help the Ukrainians? You can volunteer. They have a fallen legion. You can volunteer and go fight for them. But the government is there to protect you. The UK government is there to protect you. Whatever you I know, I assume you're British. Wait, to, to protect you, not to protect Ukraine. That's the job of the Ukrainian government, not the job of the British government. So that's how I would view it. Okay, uh, sure. thank you. We don't follow up. Okay, we'll follow up. Very quick then, very quick. I don't want them to win, right, by, by us cutting this short. <laughs> uh, do you think, so in your logic, if America didn't, like, intervene, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, but in your logic, say, it wasn't in American interest to uh, respond, like, properly with sanctions when Georgia happened in 2008, when Crimea happened in 2014, and those reactions have accumulated and yes. they gave Putin an impression that he there is not going to be a forceful reaction to the Ukraine. That, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying the United States should not have gone to war when he invaded Georgia. But in my world, cut off diplomacy. If you're an aggressor, if you're a nation that aggresses against another nation, you cut you off. So I would cut off diplomatic relationships with Russia. I would do a thousand times worse sanctions than what they're doing right now. I would isolate them completely. Um, so things that do not involve sending young men to die. So do you agree that the world, the international community, the West hasn't done enough? Of course. The international community is not. The West is weak. Russia sees it as weak, and as a consequence, that's one of the reasons he engaged. If he thought the West was strong, the West would resist him. If he thought Ukrainians would resist him as much as they have, then he wouldn't have done what he's doing. The only reason he did what he did is because he views us as weak. So I, I, I agree completely. But I, I don't think, I mean, I, I, the United States has, has fought a lot of wars it should never have. It should have never been in Korea. It should have never been in Vietnam. And maybe most controversially, it should have never been in World War I. Now, maybe you guys would still be fighting World War I, but at least I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of Americans wouldn't have died for that stupid war. The dumbest war in human history, as far as I can tell. Uh, no real reason for it, other than, I don't know, big power politics, which don't care about the individual, it's all about collectives. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire versus fill in the blank. Uh, the United States should never have entered World War One. World War Two, it had no choice because it was attacked. And of course, uh, the Nazis and the Communists were going to come after the United States at some point anyway. Okay. No, uh, it shouldn't have gone to Iraq, but that's a much more complicated question. Uh, okay, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I hope you had an interesting and thought-provoking time, and again, well, I apologize to something like this. Yeah. <laughs> Just I yeah. apologize for that. You're on. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it was fantastic Thanks. talk. Thank you for sticking around. And as, as I previously mentioned,
Uh, this event is also so a fundraiser. So we're all going to leave together in five minutes exactly. We're going to take five minutes for the fundraiser. So we're selling prints over there. Uh, Nicole has drawn them herself, and I believe. And. Uh,